two economists are here with me now and known to feud away on the Twitter sphere, and they decide to put their money where their forecasts were and sell things over a bet worth a thousand pounds. The matter has now been settled, and the defeated has paid up to the victor. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by the head of lifestyle economics at the Institute for Economic Affairs, Christopher Snowden, the victor, and professor of economics at King's College London, Jonathan Portes, the defeated. Um, Jonathan. First of all, thank you for coming in, because I think it shows incredible sportsmanship to come in and discuss this when you didn't win. So I'll let you have the first word and explain what the bet was about. Um, well, back in 2018, we were commissioned, I and my colleague Howard Reid, were commissioned by, uh, as it happens, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, but it doesn't really matter, um, to uh, look at what the impact of various changes to the ta taxes and benefits that the government was planning, um, in particular the introduction of the universal credit, the benefit freeze, uh, the rises in the minimum wage and so on, would be on incomes and poverty. Um, and we forecast at that time, based on uh, what the OBR and others predicted for the economy and what the government planned in policy terms, that child poverty would rise very sharply. And Chris said, no, that's not going to happen. It's not going to rise anything like that much. And we set a, we set a time, which was um, actually for 21-22, but the latest figures only just came out last week. Um, and as you say, Christopher was right. Um, I was wrong. Uh, child poverty did not rise. Um, as it happens, it's pretty much at the same level, depending on exactly how you measure it. Um, but we can talk about what the reasons are, but basically um, our forecast And I'm going to give Christopher the first opportunity to say, what are the reasons? Was it that you thought the ABR was useless and didn't take any note of its um, forecast, or was there something more profound than that? That would have actually been quite a good reason, as that is part of the reason why uh, child poverty didn't rise at all. Um, but no, it was simply the fact that if you look at child poverty over any period of time, it never got anywhere near the 41% that Jonathan was predicting. It had been never above 30% for a long time, uh, since about 2009. And so without even reading his report, without knowing very much about universal credit, I just said, this just doesn't ring true to me. OK, so Jonathan, how did you come up with the figures? What led you to think that? Um, to what extent were you influenced by actually not liking the scheme? Um, well, <clears throat> this, I mean, our model is simply a spreadsheet. We fed numbers and assumptions mm -hmm. into the spreadsheet. So the extent that the forecast was wrong, it's because the assumptions that we fed were in were wrong. So, I mean, as and Chris did say this at the time, so I think we should give him credit, he did in say, indeed say growth in average earnings is going to be significantly slower than is in, your mo in, in, in the model, in the forecast, and therefore the w extent to which people whose benefits are frozen will fall behind wh will, will not be nearly as much as you're saying, and, and that was basically right. Um, another thing that happened, I think, was that some of the benefit cuts that were planned then didn't happen or didn't happen in the way that they were planned. So, for example, the government planned rather large cuts in the value and number of people who got disability benefits, and it simply hasn't worked out that way for various reasons. And is this an issue with modelling? Because when forecasts are announced, it's reported as if they're highly writ, as if they're going to happen, and yet lots of forecasts turn out not to be right because the models aren't right, that the information you put in in the first place turns out not to be true. And should we be more suspicious of models fundamentally? Yes, we should. And I think we should get more people putting skin in the game, as, as Jonathan did, and all credit to him for doing that. One of the things I think that is wrong with modelling, particularly when you're dealing with you know, government handouts, is it doesn't take... They don't take into account behavioural changes. They just simply assume, well, if we, don't, if we don't give this person this much, then they're just not going to have as much money. Whereas, of course, people respond in different ways. They respond to incentives and disincentives. We have more than a, a, a million job vacancies. If somebody's not in work, they can relatively easily get into work, or they can work more hours, or they can change jobs. There are all sorts of things that people can do um, within their gift to make these models essentially redundant. So we see that a lot, I mean, including with the OBR recently, out by £30 billion within three months of the November statement, out by £30 billion. £30 billion more tax revenue than they thought there was going to be. So these models are often wrong. All models are wrong, but some are useful, as a favourite, uh, famous saying. People should have skin in the game. And this is the thing that really worries me. My experience in financial services, models were always wrong. And yet investors looked at them and economists looked at them and politicians make policy on them. 
But this leads to fundamental mistakes in investment analysis and in policy making. How do we improve it? How do we make it better? Um, well, I mean, I think, as Chris said, there's a saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. They force you to question your assumptions. They force you to say, well, if the model gives that result, what are the assumptions that are driving that result? Whether it's about how people respond or don't respond to changes in behavior, um, how businesses and consumers respond to the rise in interest rates, is it actually likely that oil, you know, if your model is assuming that oil prices will be $50 a barrel this year, well, what would happen if instead they were $100 a barrel? Those are the sorts of questions that models can usefully answer. Um, and so, for example, in Brexit, where so far actually economists have done reasonably well, actually most uh, of the evidence suggests that uh, the economy is responding to Brexit as the mainstream models predicted. That is to say it's having a significant, not catastrophic, but not zero, negative impact on the British economy. That's what the models predicted. That's what we think. Um, but the important thing is to say, well, what assumptions are driving that? We're making assumptions about how trade, increased but, trade barriers... But how do you take into account behavioural changes by uh, individuals? And how do you improve your models so that you don't have to pay out another £1,000 in years well, to come? Well, this particular model doesn't take into okay. account behavioural changes, but lots of the models that I do work with and that other economists do work with do take into account behavioural changes. So, for example, the Brexit models assume right. that if you put up tariffs, that trade will reduce... Yes, we definitely shouldn't put up tariffs. Um, are you still friends? Yes, or were yes. you friends beforehand? We're per or just competitors? Per oh, both, perfectly, perfectly yes. friendly. But, it's, yeah. a, it's a good a good. Are you annoyed that the thousand pounds has been devalued by inflation? Yes, I wish I, had, <laughs> I, I, I wish I had made it index linked. You should have made it in gold sovereigns. Um, <laughs> thank you to my guests, Christopher Snowden, Jonathan.